and done. Oh, hi, didn't see you there. Welcome back to the Holtz Effect. I'm your host, Thomas Holtz, and this is the WZBC YouTube channel. Ready to tune in at 90.3 FM, Newton, Massachusetts. Now, this is a long time coming, this particular interview. It's the first one I did with the station. It was back in April of 2020. This is with Auntie Ballas in promotion of their new record, Food Chronicles. Well, new at the time. It's now officially over a year since the release, because this is February 2021. The album came out February 2020. These two men, Martin Parna and Duke Amayo, are the front men of the band. Martin is one of the original band leaders, along with co-creator Gabriel Roth, and Duke Amayo is the front man. Martin is the saxophonist, and Duke Amayo is multiple instruments at once. He can do keyboards, he can do drums, he can sing. There's almost nothing he can't do instrumentally. Martin has had a varied career involving those with Angelique Kidjo and Adrian Quesada, and he's done a bunch of other projects on the side, including one we'll discuss later in the interview. And Duke Amayo has a rich history, which we'll also explore in the interview. He's the singer, drummer, and keyboardist for the band. He's recruited later as the front man. He's not one of the original members, but he's still quite the core, and he writes the lyrics. And he took quite a creative approach on the album Food Chronicles. This was really a renaissance of work he was doing with his other band, Duke Amayo's Fu Orchestra, a tribute to Samoa's orchestra. So, what we're going to explore is the influences that they had, their reflection on their 20-year career, and what else they've been up to in the time of coronavirus. Keep in mind, this was a month after the big March lockdown. So, this is, in a way, a historical record of the reactions they were having at the time, that I was having at the time. And it's a great glimpse into the way the station was functioning because we had just switched to remote programming. So, without further ado, I hope you will enjoy this interview and be sure to have any questions. Hello there. Hi, this is Martin from Antibalas. How are you? It's doing all right. Thanks for coming on to the show. Oh, let me put on my video. I didn't realize you. Uh... <laughs> Hi, can you see me? Yes, I can see you fine. I can hear you too, um, crystal clear. Cool. Um, I might turn off my video because um, I live in a building where everybody is online and I, would mm. re I wouldn't want to sacrifice the audio for the video unless you need. Yeah, I'm out at UC Berkeley and there's one more week of classes here. Um, everything went online about three and a half weeks ago, which was um, pretty disruptive for everybody. Like on one hand, it was like, okay, you get to finish out the semester and get the credits, but at the same time, it's not necessarily the same quality instruction or performance from the instructors, nor is it necessarily the same quality uh, performance from the students, you know, because everybody's just scrambling and figuring out how to make this thing, this new system work. So, and uh, but what year are you in school? I'm a freshman. Oh my gosh. So yeah. you have like three more years of this possible uncertainty. It's not like you're on, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry that you have to go through this. What a drag. Well, I, I mean, I get to come back. They're seniors who will never get to do this again. So they didn't yeah. get to have graduation or anything. Okay, there well, he let's, is. Um, All right, there he is. Hello there. How's it going? Thank you again for coming on to the show. It, I know, especially during quarantine and all of these hectic times, I know you've been doing a lot of like Facebook interaction, trying to maintain inter engagement. You put up ads for lessons. I'm wondering, how are you coping? Well, coping pretty well. I mean, um, here in the East Coast, uh, here in New York, we, um, we're doing uh, the usual, and we've been doing the social distancing for a minute. We, I started right after we came back from tour, because we already suspected it was going to, at least I was following, you know, some of the reliable news that I could, that I could, uh, you know, find. Um, but yeah, we coping, you know, it's, it's, um, for me, it's a little bit, you know, I'm already used to, I, I'm used to staying home a lot. So this is called like another level. And, um, um, but I, I feel for a lot of, you know, a lot of folks out there, you know, who, who can, you know, who need to be out just to make the next yeah. dollar, you know? So yeah. I'm coping. When I, when I think of those folks, like I got it good, you know, it's like almost like, uh, a privileged prison, if you will, you know, be at home with all my books and my tools yeah. and my gadgets. So, you know, there's a lot to be said for you know, yeah, being home. Yeah, definitely. I totally feel you. Like, actually, first week of quarantine, our microwave broke down. We were all complaining and like, ah, great, we don't have a microwave. But then I just, like, on the news, there's people, there are people without any homes at all who are out in the street with a great risk of getting a disease. 
So it's what you really puts one into place. Yeah, it's for me, it's been a big practice of gratitude on those lines of like, what do I have? How can I keep it working and operational? Um, is there any way that I, you know, what resources do I have, whether it's money or a time or a sewing machine that I can share and be useful in this moment, you know, because this is like, this is a call for all of us to really dig deep and figure out like, how can we, how can we step up to this challenge, you know, because all of these mechanisms that we kind of thought or assumed were in place because we pay taxes, <laughs> you know, or not. So it's like, it's a real, I think it's kind of a leveling up for everybody. Really, how strong are you? You know, how up yeah. for you are you? Or, um, for this challenge of adversity and how true is your heart? You know, like what kind of compassion do you have? Um, how rigorous are you? I mean, we were talking about this the other day of like, people are like, it's an apocalypse. But the roots of the word apocalypse are not the end of the world. It's, it's a revelation. It's an unveiling. Or, you know, to reference one of the, so um, the songs off the new record, it's, it's an exposure, you know, of what's actually there as opposed to what we thought was there. You know, so this is this time of like exposing what is actually how robust or weak this system of care is. And now that we've seen how weak it is, it's like, okay, now we have to respond. And artists, creative people have always been first responders, you know, to these crises. Maybe we're not there with like a IV or a, a, a respirator or ventilator rather, but we are there with some kind of positive energy, some kind of medicine. And right now it's like, A, we got to take care of ourselves so we can keep on making that. And people are writing, people are practicing. We're just, you know, figuring out what different tools are, will allow us to collaborate efficiently. And, um, you know, just going through it. Just trying to stay positive. Of course. Right, let's switch gears now. And I just want to congratulate you it's a little bit of a paradox given everything's gone, but congratulations on 20 years as a band. It's been that many years since the first album came out and you've had an incredible career since then. Jimmy Fallon, five times at Carnegie Hall, the Tony winning musical fella. Some of your members played an Uptown Funk, the list goes on. So would you care to reflect on that? It's, uh, you know, I think we have to look forward. It's like all of that stuff is exciting, but in this moment, you know, it's like none of that is really it's like fond memories, but it's almost like, what does that have to do with the future in the sense of maybe people know us through that, but, um, you know, it's, I think ultimately again, it, like in this kind of concept of revelation, it's like, okay, we did all that stuff. What can we do looking forward to make us more resilient? Because all of those things, none of that stuff protected us from this moment that we're in right now. It might've prepared us for it, but it, it wasn't like it created some bubble or bunker of financial immunity or creative immunity or anything like that. So I think, you know, it gives us a foundation of like, okay, you know, if we're doing stuff, maybe people know us and we'll pay attention. But, um, you know, this is a new moment, you know, and uh, my, it was my birthday the other day and my own and some of the band members and I got together and thank you. And um, we're like, we're already changed. You know, we're already changed through this. We are, once this is over or different or shifts gears, like we will be, we will all be different people because of this. But I think the question that all of us are asking is like, what kind of person do I want to be? You know, do I want to be more generous or do I want to be more fearful? Do I want to be more resourceful or do I want to be more dependent? You know, and so I, everybody is asking themselves those questions right now. And as a band, you know, uh, we're asking ourselves that question too. It's like, what does, will we be able to tour like we did? Will anything go back to the way that it was? Or do we have to prepare for something different, you know, slightly different or very different. And that part is scary because so much of what we do is about intimacy. You know, it's about intimate relate, not sexual, but I mean like emotional <laughs> intimacy between musicians and on the, dance floor it's like people are close and they're dancing and and there's this level of trust and safety that you know is going to take a minute to um to to get back to where we can establish that you know and 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 it, people have to be that open for the music to really fully penetrate you know 
So, um, you know, that makes me sad, you know, not, we're supposed to be on tour right now, like right, you know, uh, we're supposed to be on the road. And so, you know, every night where I'm like going to bed at like nine o'clock and knowing that I should, <laughs> that normal, like I look at my calendar and it's like, oh, wow, we would be on stage right now. It's, 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 it's a, it hurts, you know, it, it really, it's a bummer. Yeah, just, yeah, just, actually just, just to think about what Martin is saying in terms of like, you know, like the, the new normal is obviously, I, I don't want to go back to the normal we've had now because this is, besides the fact that it's exposed everything, not only has it exposed it, it is actually gives us a glimpse of what the future could look like if we are forecasting or depending on this type of system, right? So we, fortunately for some of us who have been kind of connected and have been following a newer way of like, uh, you know, like, like a worldview, like, like the worldview we have right now is completely against what nature is telling us, right? So now on uh, Earth Day, I feel like it's another really per perfect time to even peer, peer deeper, deeper again into what we're actually doing to be the change. What, are you, what, what is it that you're trying to look for? Or what, what do you want to be when, when this is all over? So like, I would, I, would, I would like to suggest to some of our fans to even look at, even deeper into the, like, this, very, this new record we have now, this, this Food Chronicles. It's about Kung Fu. It's about resilience, survival, you know? It's about mm -hmm. building your immune, yes. learning the movement, developing daily practices. The song was kind of, all these songs that I, you know, that I, you know, fortunately it was all about my Kung Fu practices that I was trying to, took to all this, took 20 years to like synergize it into a song form. Yeah. So I'm hopeful that from this lockdown gives us an opportunity for most of the people who actually want to read or even dig a little deeper into some of the words, the lyrics in the songs. They're just talking about how you, how you should be, how you should learn to flow, learn about the universal energy that we have around us, how it flows through you, figure out how to get into a daily practice that's going to make you go deeper inside, it's all there, right? So yeah. fortunately, and I mean, for me, I mean, especially in this period, I found another opportunity to go into the other aspect of the album, which is where the Kung Fu meets the alpha beat. So now you got to get into some Kung Fu because the Kung Fu itself is expressing, you know, like how the body should be armored, and how you should be like resilient, how you should have a, like, a, um, like a much more happier, you know, like, uh, as, as I say, you know, be, be, be the person that you want to be, see it, visualize it, learn how to meditate, learn how to visualize what you want in, on, like, on, at the end of the outcome, you know? So these songs would help, I believe, individuals that want to get a little deeper, not only into meditation, into body works, into spirituality, and then stop watching the news. Cut the news back to like half hour, for example, or whatever, just to get information and then turn it off. Tune into other, tune into other areas that helps you align with the universe that you live around, you know? So that's like more important at this point. And I feel like this pause period is the time for us to do that, you know? I do like, we got the song called, uh, you know, Sari Kong Kong that we, that we usually perform. My team was referencing that when, when we were on stage, there's a part of the song where I freeze the band. And I make the statement like, what would you do if you could stop time? Well, here we are. I feel like <laughs> <laughs> at least, you know, you, the universe is helping us to stop time for us to actually clean the air. Because if you go out now, you can see how actually nice it is outside, you, even though that the humans have been removed from outside. So I feel like we are giving us an opportunity to future cast, you know, forecast the future. You know, like, look at the next future we want to have, you know. Follow some of the newer movements, you know, the unifier movements, you know, some of the people like the resonance, you know, people who are talking about the newer sciences, about a unified world, just as a connected world, right? Connected world where everything is all connected. And I just think that you all truly connected, we should all be working together as one. Now that we actually want to have one goal and one purpose to, you know, to be able to beat this virus for the first time, we actually, actually are one, you know? So I feel like this period of being, of being in, a, in a oneness place is where we can actually find that shift within each of us, you know? So I'm, I'm as, as much as I'm, I'm sad that we cannot, you know, come together anymore, 
But to be honest with you, this process of coming together, the next way of coming together will be much more of a conscious way. Because we're just going to come together and we can't take it for granted. Now, if, yeah. you, if you're coming together and you are, you, you are forced to be six foot apart, I, mean, I don't know if you saw lately, there was, there was something that was posted about, uh, there was a, uh, a, a protest in Israel. Really? That was done no, I didn't that. six foot apart. Each, it was the most powerful thing I ever saw. You could see the organized image of people standing six foot apart and almost looked very choreographed. And you know, they were all wearing masks with messages on it. I mean, that's what I'm expecting next. You know, yeah, that, that's, that's responsible organized, protesting. Yeah, responsible we protesting. We are Michigan, just in giant cluster. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, so, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an exciting time for all of that. Exciting, the, the fear can be flipped into into excitement, to get involved in something that actually engages your mind so you can remove that fear because fear reduces your immune or it makes your immune system, you know, it compromises you. So you don't want to be listening or watching anything that brings, your, brings negativity into you and, and drops your, uh, uh, your immune down. You want something that elevates you, right? So the elevation part is music, watching all positive stuff, watching good movies or watching stuff like Gaia TV, which is like, you know, Gaia is like a, a spiritual network, you know? Consume your mind with those sort of stuff. And then all of a sudden, you're going to come out on the other side, stronger, resilient, a changed person. Because that change is individual. Because if it doesn't happen individually, there's no way for you to actually express it, you know. So we have all these leaders who are not looking, who are looking at money and, <laughs> and economics. They're not looking at within themselves. They're not even looking at how they feel inside, you know. So they, they, are, they, are, they are completely, like, dealing under the, the worldview that we have today that has brought us to where we are now. The worldview of today is not working. You know, we got to go back to a much more connected worldview that's more aligned with nature, which is what, you know, some of the newer science is talking about today. So I think that's a good yeah. thing for all of us, you know. To, to piggyback on what Amaya was saying, um, so much of this worldview that we've been working on has been about growth and not about healing. So if you take something that's sick and you grow it and you try to grow it faster and faster, you're also going to grow that trauma. And that's, you know, and all of these bad ways of being. And that's kind of where we are in this moment is that, yeah, there have been certain people working on healing, but the main focus has been on how do we grow our company? How do we make it bigger? How do we make this institution bigger? How do I, you know, um, build up my bank account without thinking about all these things that also need to be tended to. And um, now, that, now that most of us can't be making money, it's like this is this is the moment to stop and look and be like, all right, what what are all the different ways that I need to heal my family or the people around me need to heal, and that you know our democracy needs to heal, our systems of care need to heal, you know. Um, okay we've been turning our back on all that stuff. So it's a, it's a, it's a serious, serious moment of reflection um, in, in like that way. Like yeah, it's time for, yeah. Wow. That's a lot of profound stuff. <laughs> all right, so I'm switching gears now. I'm noticing a lot of overlap lyrically with the record. Like a lot of stuff you're hearing in Fight on Finish and Fist of Flowers. So I wanted to ask you, so I understand this being a milestone record is a synthesis. You're talking earlier. It's the first time we put Kung Fu into a record. Even though despite, I know you have your other band, the Fu Orchestra, which has already been doing a lot of lion stance rhythms. Correct. So, and speaking of which, I understand three of the songs on the record are from that original album, First Lessons in Kung Fu. Correct. It features MT, TT, Fist of Flowers, and a mental one. I want to ask you what led you to record them with Antibalas, because they seem pretty well developed in the original recording, which is about, what, 18 years old now? Yeah, it, it just needed um, a, uh, a more current approach, or a, a more like, kind of like the musicians that, that, that played on, on, the, on, the, on the previous one, you know, like, I felt like that energy has moved to a different, a different place now, you know, we have, we have, we have, uh, different set of guys. I have a different mindset myself, or at least I have evolved my mindset. Like when you revisit, you know, materials, you, you could, you could now, you know, add in some of your wishes, you know, I have a better understanding of what some of these melodies were, were saying. And, and I kind of like, as you say, a, a polished 
version, you know, more, uh, um, you know, arranged to more contain on, on, on an LP version, you know, like, uh, and so all that, you know, all that little adjustment was necessary to put it out in this form. And as well as we were, we were just making a different place. Um, and it's always interesting to re, you know, to, to, re, uh, uh, to revisit compositions that you wrote because they are constantly evolving, you know, I mean, at least I've never really thought of myself as staying in one place all the time, obviously. We always need to evolve, grow, and, uh, and expand, right? So at least from my perspective, this was a, 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 another opportunity to, to evolve the song, to like update them, you know? And, and also by presenting them in this, this newer form, it also allowed me to, to message a little bit, you know, like get messaging a bit more, 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 either more direct, you know, or more subtle, you know, like some of the message, some of the things that I, some of the messages that I was trying to, you know, get across was from like a, in a, from a Kung Fu perspective where things are always sort of subtle. It's not always in your face. It's like a subtle change. So if you listen to the record, listen to the older version, and listen to this version, you will see all some of the subtle nuances and some of the subtle movement of things that have, that has changed. And it's always exciting to do that, at least for me. I like the idea. And, and each time I play a song, I'm constantly finding a new way, you know, to commit communicate the same message. So for me, it was, like a, it was an uh, exciting opportunity to do it in this form. And as well as, you know, having, you know, Gabe and, you know, Gabe, you know, as a producer to really, uh, he played bass on all of it. Yeah. And it was interesting and exciting for me to, to hear him do some minor adjustments here and there. And it was, it was kind of cool. Like all the, all the, you know, the kind of things, the way it was produced in, in this version, it's totally different from the previous version. The previous version was more like just hit record, you know, which because everything was all just there. And when everything was recorded back then, it wasn't as much concerned with how long songs should be because I was just like, it doesn't really matter it's what the length of the song is, this is how it came out. So, and in this, this newer version, the concern was to make everything fit on an LP versus a, versus a CD. Yeah, you can only put like twenty minutes on a side, so yeah, that yeah. kind of made us yeah. have some. Well, you know, the sound some, stronger, you know. Like well, you want yeah, to sound louder. Yeah, <clears throat> some arrangement choices of like, okay, you know, we could make this. The longer the songs were, the quieter they would actually physically be on the record because really? the more space. Yeah, the more space on an LP, the grooves can't go as deep, and so you don't hear the bass as loud. So. It, Really? It's I didn't like, know okay, that. we could make this minutes aside and stretch out compositionally, but sonically, yeah, in digital, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, but in the audio mastering, and so we're always, you know, we're working with that tone, they're a vinyl label. So, yeah. you know, those, the, the sort of technical constraints, um, uh, you know, presented some kind of, I don't want to say challenges, but just kind of like, uh, almost like um, guidelines in in a way that kind of made us go back and refine the songs in a certain way that in like Amaya was saying in a, in a lot of ways the messaging is a lot more direct because we didn't have room for uh, a five minute you know saxophone solo or a keyboard solo or a trumpet solo or something like that prior to the vocals coming in we had to you know get right to the message a lot faster um, and so that is, you know, reflected in the, the songs are really rich, but they're also a lot leaner um, compared to, say, earlier versions of that or even just like earlier records where, you know, a song like um, Sister is 19 minutes long. Yeah. On, <laughs> that we recorded a few years <laughs> ago. Song, um, and we might yeah. go back to that, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's been, one of the things that the, the music that we make inherently is a long form music and we've had to do every so often like um, short versions of the songs like uh, when we were on Jimmy Fallon or Jimmy Kimmel, we basically were given like three minutes, 45 seconds to do our singles. And while that was exciting, it felt really um, uh, rushed in the sense of like, this is, you know, the music is like a courtship. And it's like, we didn't, we didn't even get a chance to like hold hands with the music before we were taking our clothes off. And it was like, whoa, hey, you know, <laughs> it was like, um, 
it, 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 so it's a very, it's a slow kind of meditative music, even when you do kind of um, try to refine it and make it more, um, you know, concise. And so this, I think, you know, around the songs are around like six and a half to eight and a half, nine minutes yeah. versus other records where the songs, you know, on average were between like 10 and 15, as long as 19 minutes. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a weird moment because people are experiencing music in a totally different way than they were when we started making, it. you know, it's like not even everybody had a CD player when we were first a band, you know, yeah. people are still hardcore vinyl cassette, mini disc, you know, uh, some CDs, but no, that concept of even making a digital copy didn't exist, you know, or Napster or Spotify or any of the streaming services weren't even a thing. And now it's like, people consume music in a different way. They bounce around a lot more. Um, and all of that affects how they respond to the music. And, um, you know, so it's not like we, we make our songs shorter because of that, but it is a, a different reality. I think people's attention spans have, have changed a little bit, you know, how they respond. Like if you were going to put on a record that's 20 minutes long, you kind of drop the needle and you let it play and you sit down or do something and listen to the whole thing. Whereas if you're, if you have the music in the pocket, if it's not hitting you right away, you might just, you know, bounce around to some other song or it might skip or a phone call might come in that interrupts the song and makes the song stop playing. All these different things we experience, you know, we absorb and um, digest the music in a different way. So that, you know, is something that's very different about this moment. That's interesting. I don't come from that vinyl world myself. I don't have a vinyl player. I do have a CD uh, player. It kind of feels a subversion, actually. When I was growing up, CDs are all the rage, and now vinyl sales are higher than they've ever been in many, many decades. So I don't know, I'm just kind of, I mean, I feel it just, I'm always very really fascinated by that approach with production, with the idea of the vinyl and all the tape, no digital mastering. I'm here using like a USB in and out box. So it's always fascinating. Let's talk about that, actually. How did you produce the record? I know you put a few pictures on social media, and I'm a gear nerd, so my curiosity got very peaked. So besides the vintage tape machines and your 50 saxophones, what did you use to record the record? Well, it was yeah. a Daptone yeah. Records. We made that choice. We made a bunch of records there. And uh, basically, the mm, I would say about 80% of the record was all recorded at once with the bass, uh, drums, guitars, percussion, um, one set of keyboards, horns, all being recorded simultaneously into microphones onto a uh, analog tape machine yeah. from, I think it was like from 1969 or 70, but about, you know, something about 50 years old. Um, and basically, you know, playing through and if somebody messed up, we would go back and listen and be like, okay, can we live with that? You know, and people don't mess up really because it's a really good band, <laughs> but we do one or two takes of each one and then figure out, okay, are we good with this? Can we move on to the next tune? Do we need to take a break? And that chunk of work happens over about three days. And then, um, and that involved a lot of people. Like at any given time, there might be 16 people up in the studio between musicians, uh, engineers, guest musicians, uh, people with cameras. Um, and then a couple, like at the end of the summer, we went out to, Amayo and I went out to Riverside, California, where Gabe Roth lives and has his sort of auxiliary, auxiliary studio and then did finishing touches, uh, you know, refinements to the vocals. Uh, Amayo did vibes, keyboards. We got to really kind of play around and take a lot of time with finding these keyboard textures and sounds that you can't really do when you have 16 other people waiting on you, you know, and time is of the essence. So it was kind of in two phases, like the New York phase, California phase and then um, Gabe got to work mixing it you know and trying to make sure everything there was a lot more that we had on the record that we had recorded than could sort of live in the final version of the song because it's just so rich like live it's all going to be there but he had to do a lot of like kind of carving out frequencies and EQs so that you know you could yeah. make sure to hear the higher texture of some note that Amaya was singing and not necessarily the higher pitch of the hi-hat or the shaker at that time. So there was a lot of 
you know, there's so much going on, yeah. like a range, you know, like a house with a lot of furniture, it could feel really cluttered. Or if you move mm -hmm. things around, you don't necessarily have to throw anything out, but it's how you orient it, you know? Yeah. And um, so Gabe is a master of that. And, um, you know, and then the record, we were, we listened to the final mixes, made some comments, and then it got mastered and then turned into uh, vinyl and CD and digital versions. And Amayo did the cover art. He can speak on that. He did that yeah. all by hand. I'd love to speak about that, actually. It's beautiful work. Yeah. Very beautiful. And I love the symbolism. It's supposed to be Williamsburg being reclaimed, right? Yeah. Manhattan yeah. being reclaimed. Avenue of the Americas now becoming an indigenous way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, something like that. And one, one, one final thing that Martin uh, did mention was like, yeah, that when people make mistakes sometimes, like if it's in the guitar or whatever part, we still have one chance, if we have time, for that one person to go back and just overdub all of just that one section, you know, like we could just do a full pass to the whole thing. Those are all part of the, the tweaking stages before, uh, before the, the mix, before the mixes start, you know. So yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's also extremely exciting, you know, to like, especially in the mixing stage, you know, where you, you see DJs on, 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 you know, turntable doing stuff. Well, you got the, the, the board, with all the instruments. So sometimes Gabe, will, Gabe has two hands and 10 fingers. So he might need another pair of other hands, right? So to make these moves, so either pull back this volume of that instrument just in this section and then bring it back up, you know? So those kind of moves are really, really yeah. exciting to, you know, to experience it while it's happening, you know? So those are all the, all the cool stuff that producers do on the analog. Uh, board anyway um We're as far as, you know as far as the artwork if you you know the artwork was just you know um part of you know i, I went to call it as an illustrator so I, I had i had already been doing portraits were my specialty when i was in college but you know i didn't really you know uh i kind of moved on and i did medical illustration technical drawings so all those elements i try to bring it back in as as a way to tell you the full story of this journey as well as far as you know uh taking over a city that's that lo that's losing its heart you know if you will so we brought the music yeah. back and kind of take over new york city and take over that I, I intentionally put it on that on that block the avenue of the americas and incidentally that illustration the the backdrop i had done that like you know over i did it like in in um 2000 it when I did that, I think 2009 or something like that. Really? I did that when I was working this job uh, as a technical illustrator of uh, an advertising agency. So they wanted me to do an illustration of, the, of New York City because we were having a convention next to uh, Music City Hall. So in my mind of like, you know, uh, I was telling myself, how can I take over New York City? You know, like I, heard, I was thinking, thinking that back then, like, <laughs> The system is just out, you know. Mm -hmm. As an illustrator, I was losing my job as an analog illustrator, you know, mm -hmm. by hand because oh, computer man. graphics was coming in. So computer graphics was slowly displacing people like me. So mm -hmm. that was like my last charade of saying, you know, I'm gonna stick it to the man. I'm gonna do an <laughs> illustration and take over New York City. So I had done a, an illustration of that building being uh, gutted out, right, and being taken over by this electrical contractors. So I had to flip it now, 20 years later or whatever, however many years later now, flip it to now instead of, instead of these contractors taking over, musicians are taking it over, you know? So it's like, like uh, that. Yeah, yeah. So that was, you know, kind of in, a, in a conceptual way that I was, that illustration was yeah. presented. Yeah. So speaking of which, there's a, I know you've been talking a lot about identity and reclaiming Kung Fu. I want to go back to that. You've talked a lot about Kung Fu and your influences. First of all, for the audience, you're listening to this, this guy's a renaissance man. He's a Sifu in the Jiao Ga Kung Fu school. He played football at Howard University, which got you trials with the Washington Redskins and the Montreal Concords. Is that correct? Yeah. And on top of that, you're an illustrator, dancer, choreographer, and singer. How do you do it? Seriously, it's insane. Well, you know, it's, it's that, that, it's that, uh, that worldview of, I always had that, but I didn't call it a worldview. I just knew things are connected, always. You know, like, so I've, I've had that mind thing since I was about, because I got fortunate at 10 years old, 
I got that book called the, the, the Third Eye. I opened my third eye since I was 10, you know, like in a kind of interesting way, but in my, in, in a child's mind, that's kind of how I, I had, uh, how I was operating because I was in a situation where I was living among about 10 people that live, live with us at the time with my mom. So I'm a mom's only child, but I was always raised to, to be yeah, the person that, you know, like just realize that you're not alone and we, we have to share with others that don't have, you know? So, I, I kind of, that was always my norm. So I'm always naturally what I would, would, would tend to uh, I'd be drawn to a big crowd or a crowd or an, like a, a band, if you will, or like a group of people, you know? So I started martial arts in Nigeria back then. And, you know, I knew it was kind of like that kind of helped me. It helped me navigate my way through my, through my house, the neighborhood. So over time, it became adding more to this building block, you know? So as I added to the block, okay, first was getting to America, I had to fight for that. My mom wouldn't let me go. So my Kung Fu came into play. I use a lot of my, you know, Kung Fu smarts, you know, do everything my mom wanted to do while I was actually working hard to put together all the you know, paperwork that I needed to come to America. So that was my first Kung Fu. My first Kung Fu was, you know, so in a way, Kung Fu is actually means adroitness to being very smart and being able to use both sides of your brain. So you can say left side, right side. So left brain, right, right brain. Like exactly. So you start yeah. in, in fights, I'm finished. So, um, so it was always a way for me to operate, but just, it was all my, it's very, very individual, very me. That's me, you know, and then I, and then I eventually come into DC and come into New York, to DC and then to New York. DC, I did the thing. I had a, a, a group of dancers. I had about 30 dancers called the New Race. And it was about, you know, it was, we, we, we had a theme called Unity, U N I T Y. When, um, uh, you know, Queen Latifah had that hit song, U N I T Y. We were kind of hot in DC because we had this t shirt that each of us had a t shirt. One says U, another one says N. So all of us had Unity. So when we stood together, we had U, me, T, you know. So that actually was kind of cool. I said, well, how can I do this in New York? It was a bit too corny for New York. New York is not going to be into this kind of U9 CY, you know. So <laughs> I ended up in Williamsburg, found that uh, the space. So I was already doing clothing from back home because my aunt used to make all of our clothes. So in my own mind, I, I never think of buying clothes. I always look up, if I see something I like, I'll get the fabric, aunts will make it for me. So that was already part of my MO, like, Okay, now how I'm, I'm gonna make my clothes somehow. So I found some tailors that work with me, and you know, so we kind of I had I had a nice team that I, that I work with. And I had a couple. That's of like a recurring theme at Daptone. Yeah, Charles Bradley making his own clothes. Sharon Jones did all of her own handiwork. I don't know what it is, but I don't know what's in the water over there. It's just survival, man. You know, it's just, and yeah. and being a, being an artist though. See, the art knows no boundaries. So once. Once you've honed into your art and what, what really makes you, you know, excited. Because for me, I was always excited whenever I was working on these projects. If it wasn't exciting, then I, you know, then obviously I'm over to the next thing. So the excitement kind of drove me and the excitement of the new, the next new thing. You know, like five year period, I stand with five whole years on some skill. And once that skill, once I've reached a certain point, I don't know if you want to call it mastery, but to a point where I, it's, it's, I can, I can, uh, you know, I can navigate pretty easily with that particular skill. Then I want to add another skill on top of it to, you know, to refine it. So that refinement process led me to new skills, new skills. And the music was always there because when I was doing the new race thing in DC, I had, uh, this, um, I had, you know, 30 dancers. So we, I used two DJs and I played percussion. So it's the DJs and me on percussion rarely on percussion because I'm too busy like, you know, producing and working with the kids and teaching these movements and the whole choreography stuff. So, but the percussion part was I lay down the, I lay down the groove and the, the DJs would just kind of take it and, and, you know, and provide us the soundtrack for the performance. So the soundtrack was always percussion. And that became a soundtrack for my fashion shows and I needed to expand on the percussion thing. And then when, when I went to Balas, uh, and I connected, I met Martin and, and Gabe in Williamsburg here when we, when we met. Uh, they came to my storefront because I, you know, I had this fashion event that I did every, 
I mean, once a month, every, yeah. depending on how often I do these fashion events. So they saw my posters and they connected with me and the connection became, you know, let me see how I can get some more students in my Kung Fu. So I wanted to get more students in, in, in an interesting way. They, they wanted to augment the band. You know, the band needed a bit more stuff so we can get this band working as a real solid band. You know, it didn't have the singing yet, but it was most instrumental. So I checked out the band. It was, the drummer was not really an Afrobeat drummer. So mm -hmm. in my mind, I was like, you know, this is interesting, but it was not, it, it didn't call me until I got a call. Yeah. I'm sitting for Shekere and the story is, you know, where, where we are now. But uh, <laughs> interestingly though, Williamsburg at that period, because, you know, it was like post millennium, there was a millennium bug. Everything was going nuts, people were going crazy. The yeah. world was about to end, whatever. <laughs> it was a different kind of world ending uh, situation then. But it was still, you know, it, it was the beginning of, you know, what I say, uh, you know, the agitation that led to where we are now. It was, it was that tension built and built and built until, you know, it's about to crash or crash, if you will. I think it's crashed. Now that we have this, this pause moment is a, is a moment of, it's like, we are in the crash period. The yeah. post is what we're trying to hopefully come out of much stronger. So um, yeah. that journey um, you know, has really, you know, really expressed, I mean, at least shown me that, yes, definitely, uh, art knows no boundary, but, you, but, you need, but if you tinker it with the, with the right view, with the right attitude, you know, you got, to, you got, you got something good going, like, you know, like, Fortunately for me right now, uh, that song Kiss the Flower, for example, has created like a, a um, beautiful landscape to some of the things that uh, I've been trying to express, you know, like when we talk, when we express in like uh, the, the universal force and, and how it affects, affects us and how we are connected to it and we actually can reshape it, we can, you know, we can entrain the energy one in us and align it with that out there, I mean, with the one around us. So there is this unifying, it's like a unifying force field around us that's being expressed here that we're missing, you know, we're, we're, we're missing because we're, we're so individualistic in our ways, you know, in our worldview, you know, we, you know, you know, like you gotta be, you know, you gotta find your own way versus the idea that we are so, yeah, while you're finding your way, we're connected, completely connected. That as you're finding your way, the person or the other, your, your, your feedback loop is another person who's also following the way that you're following. So there's always that connection. We are completely connected. And I think if we start seeing connectivity of all things, we can really start making some real change. In that. And this is the time to, to help to make that actually real, I mean, to help us realize that. Speaking of which, Martin, I understand you have a series of songs coming out now called Los Pimentos, um, that they're data sonification. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I'm working on, um, I saw something really, well, I've, I've been, I don't know where, how far back to roll, but um, I've been thinking a lot about different ways to trans, uh, translate um, things from one sort of media to another and one of the things and i'll send you the link after this but uh i suggest everybody go check out for multiple reasons is this data visualization of the transatlantic slave trade and so basically it's a map of you see the african continent europe the americas and starting in the 1500s uh they they were using data archives, like basically logs from each ship where the captain wrote, we're leaving on this date, we have this many captive Africans, we arrived at this port. So using all that information, they created a, uh, like a, each ship is a dot and depending on how fast the trip was, it travels that fast. Depending on how many people were on the ship, it's bigger or smaller. And the whole, and so you watch it from the 1500s to the late 1800s, and it was so powerful because you realize you really see the way that basically Africa was bled for, you know, of people, of resources, of ideas, of communities for over 300 years. And all of those, you know, ended up in the Americas and also in Europe. Um, 
and I was like, well, this, this is amazing. What would this sound like, you know, to see that those sort of records that are just, you know, handwritten entries, all tabulated, turn into a visual graphic, what would that sound like? So that's one of the things that I'm working on. And then as coronavirus came out, it was like, wow, this is a whole other set of data. What does, what will this sound like? And one of the challenges with that is it's like, it's so changing every day. There's so many different ways you can approach it. So because it's kind of a new field for me, I'm like, well, in the, while I'm trying to figure out what to do with the data, I'm also going to do just emotional sonification, which is basically just, you know, some version of people, people call it the blues. People call it a lot of different things, but it's just, what does your, what is the sound of this, all this data in your heart? So as I'm working on the sort of technical aspects of the actual numbers and figuring out I can turn that into sound, but it's a lot harder to turn it into music, you know, like it'll just kind of sound like this garbled mess. So I'm really trying to figure out these creative forms and, you know, different, as Amayo was saying, different, this is a moment where we're developing and refining these different practices. You know, we can't be showing up to do what we've been doing. So we refine what we've been working on develop some new ideas or get deeper into them. And, um, you know, so I'm thinking about this because we're, a lot of us are educators too. And the success that I think that we've had in education is being able to translate different things into different learning languages, whether it's like us doing a workshop where it's in English and in French or us, you know, uh, doing something for advanced musicians versus less advanced musicians. All of it is sort of like, uh, empathizing with the learners and figuring out where they're at. And so with this, you know, with this process, we're, we're trying to translate, you know, we're always, artists are always translators, you know, translating ideas and feelings into visual arts, movement, music, lyrics. And, um, you know, that's ultimately, that's what that is. It's another act of translation and just trying to, and, and something to keep me tied to my daily practice of, um, learning how to record and produce better, touching my saxophone, getting developing my guitar skills. And so this kind of gave me like a, a, a format of like a reason to just sit down and, and deal with this <laughs> in a creative way every day, you know? To do it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah. So I want to ask you though, how do you do that sonification? So I know a lot of electronic artists will just take a picture and throw it into a VST and just turns into a sound wave. It's often like a garbled mess, like you said. I'm wondering what's the technology behind that. Uh, right now, a lot of it is by hand. I mean, you can ultimately hmm. do a lot of it through scripting. So basically, you would get a spreadsheet that has columns with different types of data. And you would say, I want, let's just say um, we're looking at COVID-19. You know, you could say, I want the, uh, you could plot it out over it. First, you're looking at like a timeline. Right now, there's no end to the timeline. So that's what makes this project difficult is it's something that keeps on growing, right? But you could say, I want the number of cases to influence the volume. So say, the, or the number of cases times a thousand. So say there were a thousand cases reported in February, maybe the volume of the sound would be one. And then there's 2000. So then the sound, volume of the sound will be two and it keeps on going up. But what's so crazy is that the curves and the math are so crazy that it gets loud very quickly, you know? <laughs> so, you know, almost piercingly loud, you know, because of the way that the virus kind of exploded. Um, so part of it is like, okay, I can make sounds, but how to make this music. Um, but being able to look at a graph, I mean, some people can't see. So this is another way of being like, all right, this is, if you can imagine that, X, Y, and these are the, the things that determine the sound. The volume is, is the increase in cases. And hopefully we'll hear, you know, hopefully we'll, that volume will go back down to zero at some point. Um, you could have different pitches that are mapped to countries. You know, you could have um, other more happy, agreeable, joyful sounds pop up every time somebody goes into the hospital and is cured. You could have another set of sounds when people die. So you could, it's basically, there's no right way or wrong way to it. It's, it's ascribing different characteristics of sound to pieces of data and then assembling that all together 
into an audio piece. So that can kind of be done with everything. It could be done, you could go into your smartphone and sonify the data on your physical activity, like your heartbeat, there's your BPM, the number of steps that you've taken, you know, uh, the number of cups of coffee you drank, all of those can be kind of turned in, inspired and turned into things that control aspects of sound. So, and then I'm working, experimenting, working with synthesize, like is the raw sound, is it a saxophone? Is it a voice? Is it a tone on a synth? Uh, is it a drum hit? Um, so it's really, it's like, it's kind of a giant new sandbox that is like part of the way of how I'm spending the days in, in addition to like figuring out when are we all gonna be back together as a band, you know? <laughs> so we've been having these Thursday like Zoom kind of happy hours just to reconnect and, you know, share ideas and be amongst each other and, you know, um, but it's, it's been really, uh, you know, especially for most of the band is in New York and that's one of the, probably one of the hardest hits on the in, entire globe right now. So it's, it's hard to imagine like, oh yeah, we got, we got 20 new songs coming out this Friday. Mm -hmm. Like that's, no, we're not mm -hmm. there right now. But, yeah. but what's important right now is that people are staying alive. They're keeping their hearts together. They're keeping their, their health up, their practice up. And, um, you know, that's, that's the focus right now. I'm just thinking, listening as a neuroscience major, I'm just blown away because that sounds awesome. It sounds like something I totally want to do, but never will at college. So yeah, thank you for <laughs> no, describing that. Suggest, Give a little taste uh, of what I won't get. <laughs> um, switching gears, I was going to so, suggest that you might yeah. want to, yeah. I was going to suggest to my team, I want to check out Colors too, you know, because yeah. you know how, if, if, you know, Colors are science sound or, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. if you do the Doremi thing, you know, with the sound yeah. and- Like you know, synesthesia. Yeah. You might want to, you know, that might be another way to like to map it out. And if, and if there is the intention behind it, like this, um, this data could help to, you know, to help deal with like whatever mental illness, like yeah. to, to, you know, to, to see how it, it affects different, different, because, you know, like all no, this, yeah, all this information as well, it's, it, it, uh, it's being recorded, obviously. They say it's being recorded on our DNA. So the DNA carries over from generations. Yeah. So there's mm -hmm. all this information that's sitting in our, on our DNA that could be triggered with some of these sounds, you know, if you, you know, to, oh, yeah. for, especially for healing, you know, healing yeah. thing is, you know, trauma stays in a whole family for like generations because it mm -hmm. was never dealt with, you know. So anyway, so that's, that's no, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Pretty yeah. Cool. Sound is so powerful. I mean, from that to, um, you know, the military, unfortunately, they've, ex they know a lot about this, but ultimately it's like using sound as a weapon. Yeah. You know, we already know that there's certain volumes and frequencies that make the body shut down in certain ways. And those have been employed, unfortunately, but yeah. you know, that's really sad, but also it's like, okay, so what's the flip side of that? What's the light side of that? that there's a very open uh, field for, um, and, and it, it's already, you know, people have been working on it for a long time, but like modalities of like how using sound as healing. Um, also, as far as health, we know that different viruses, things have terminal frequencies. So maybe there is some sonic frequency that could assist, you know, not necessarily a silver bullet, but mm -hmm. there's some sort of pulse or frequency that, we can use this uh, almost like a disinfectant, you yeah. know, uh, yeah, yeah. and anybody mm -hmm. who is, um, you know, in a religious practice, whether it's chanting or possession that sort of triggered by, you know, drum rhythms or yeah. hymns or whatever it is. It's like, yeah. you know, within religion, there's a big interface with um, sound and frequencies and different chords or different rhythms, different combinations of sound that, have been refined, but it's, uh, yeah, you, you know, we're a long way out, from understanding you should, it. You should check out, uh, I, I know I keep mentioning Gaia TV. There's one doctor there that goes in depth into, you know, all this, res it's, it's, it's part of this whole resonance project where all this, this new science is coming out, which is, which is telling us about self healing and can, comes from all this, you know, sound and what you expose yourself to and which, uh, how many, what, what, uh, the sound waves and hurts for you to listen to, for you to, to trigger healing for different organs, right? So it's all it's kind of there, but it just hasn't been experimented with deeply enough, or there's not enough fun going into that area. 
But yeah, man, you there was a couple of doctors that that I, I checked that stuff out. I'll 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 look it up and I'll I'll send you a link on that, Martin. I appreciate that. Thank you. Sounds really interesting. I'll send you a list. Yeah. Yeah. Some pretty some really awesome stuff, man. That is really mind blowing. I mean, like this this is like part of the coolest stuff about this period is telling us now. This is that time when you can actually have an you know get a, you can actually go there and trigger these parts of your mind and your brain and. And there are exercises for it. It just hasn't, you know, it's just not been, you know, I've been told about this stuff, you know? So, um, so good, good stuff, man. Some good stuff coming out. You know? And I'm excited about this. this I mean, not, not to say I'm excited about being in a lockdown, but I'm excited about the opportunity that is presents us. You know, it almost yeah. like it gives, it's like a, as, as, as Martin was saying earlier, is it's a time to level up. It's, it's like, a lot of people are becoming like instant millionaires. Some people are, you know, like this is like so many things are shifting for a lot of people right now, you know. So it it would, you know, it would it would be a disservice to oneself to just kind of sit there and wait for the wait for the system to wait for the government to open up, and what you what you ex, you're expecting to go back to your normal is not going to be there, you know. It'd be different, right? So that's the work should be done now for you to know how to be when you come out of this. And, you know, all this mm -hmm. information is there for us to, like, yeah. you know, consume and instead of the news. You know what I'm saying? Like, the news is, like, blocking all that part of your brain to open you up to get all this beautiful informa information and it's casting doubt and fear, you know, like, daily. Turn, first thing you turn on the news, like... Group so, thing, too. Yeah, you know? It's like, yeah, wait a yeah. minute, you know? We, we, we know already. So the only thing we need to know now is just... How long, right? So that how long is not going to happen from listening to news every day, you know. Yeah. You can just set your yeah. own time and say, I'll wait for like two next two months, then I'll check in again or something or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I don't know if you guys want to talk about politics a little. I know it's a big part of your identity, and you probably have a lot to say on the matter, because you talk a lot, like on uprising, you have gentrification, gold rush, Native American displacement, misogyny on sister, especially even given our current climate, the election cycle. I want to get your thoughts. Well. I feel like ultimately the, the, the virus has thrown everything, the, whatever discussion or way that both parties were going into this election um, five, five months ago, the corona, how each person is going to deal with questions of health, how this is not going to happen again, um, how to get people back on their feet, those questions are going to become central, you know? Um, also what place, the United States has in the world, both like as a team player and as a sort of former superpower, you know, like what, I, what, you know, the, all of these different questions, you know, so, and I think people really need to think long and hard about, um, you know, what is important to them. And like this, this moment makes us realize that we're literally all in it together. Like one person who is asymptomatic can get hundreds of people sick. Like we all matter. So which president is going to represent the that idea that we all matter, that we all need to be taken care of at least to a basic level, and you know, and then move forward from there. I mean, on a personal level, I'm not. I'm going to show up and 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 vote for Joe Biden and look on each down ballot uh, who is the most progressive person, you know. Um, that is really pushing for more progressive stuff. You know, I mean, we got who we got. And I think at this point, it's important to um, realize like this is, you know, at least at the presidential level, it's this very flawed popularity contest, but we realized what we did wrong the last time. There were too many people who didn't show up and vote, too many people who got really in the weeds about things that they didn't love about Hillary Clinton. And they're like, you know what, I'm not gonna vote or I'm gonna do a third party thing. And this is where we are now, you know, and ultimately, I don't love Hillary, but if she were president right now, we'd be in a very different very place, different place. Yeah. you know, you know, look at Germany with Angela mm. Merkel, who took science. Oh. She is a scientist. She took it seriously, got out ahead of it. Like Obama set up um, a very forward thinking uh, squad to deal with pandemic stuff. Um, five, five, six, seven years, like early in his somewhere in his first term um, that was discontinued about three years ago by mm. Trump. Well, Clinton would have continued that and bolstered yeah. it, you know, and we'd be in a much different situation. The economy probably wouldn't be shut down. And so ultimately, it's like, I hope in general with politics, there is a lot of immature people 
who have been taking a, up a lot of space that are like thinking about short term gains at the risk, you know, and not thinking about the longer term profit, you know, we need to put money aside for these things. You either pay now or you pay later. And ultimately, nobody likes to pay taxes. But when you're paying all your taxes, and then we're in a situation like this where citizens are being asked to make masks for hospitals, it's like, wait a second, where are we, you know, so I think ultimately we want to, we, we should demand more and um, just prepare, you know, educate ourselves more, read more, uh, read more good stuff and stay away from stuff that's not vetted, that's not, um, that's rumorous. Uh, and it's going to, but I think the campaign season is going to be really tricky because what does it mean to campaign over the next six months with social distancing? Are there going to be rallies? Like everything, so much stuff is going to be electronic, you know? Yeah. Um, so we really have to prepare ourselves to, on one hand, stay plugged in, but on the other hand, not stay too plugged in, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. So I was like, you need to have like your, this is my plug-in, it's like to-do list. I'm only going to plug in for, you must like take 10 minutes, whatever it is. Don't get mm -hmm. sucked into this because, and then it's like, it's asking each of us to like kind of select, you know, like which, which channels to be listening to or your source of news. And if you're going to get, just get the news and get out, you know, don't get the news mm -hmm. and, and because they're trying to make this entertainment. That's why we're like, right, watching news for 24 hours. You don't even, you, you are not watching the news. The news is on. It's going to your subconscious. It's like all this stuff that, that, that uh, enters our conscious, from conscious into conscious and then manifest into, you know, physical, you know, you know, either you feel weird, you know, have back pains, whatever you have, you know, like you, it always manifests into something not good. So um, I'm, I'm with Martin on that, on that tip of like, I'm, I'm voting for Biden just because I need to reset. I need to like this, you need at least someone that can actually tell you that red is red, you know? If someone can just tell us the truth, we can start from there. I mean, look at how low we've got. We've, right now, it's, the, the bar is set so low, anyone that runs in there, I'll vote for him, except Trump, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's come to that point where you just want to put somebody else in there, then go hard at them. Because mm -hmm. this next president, he's not going to be sitting there idle. He's, he's, about, to, he's yeah. about to, yeah. We're going to bombard this person with like all kinds of like, you know, take action stuff. And, you know, you know, and then if, he, if he picks Warren, um, Elizabeth Warren as a running mate, I'll, I'll be elated because you, you're picking a manager, someone to, to like make sure stuff is put back to normal, you know. So that's, you know, I think... Mm -hmm. Politics is very, is very simple right now. It's, sim it's, it's simpler to a point where someone other than this guy, that's, even, that's actually better. So I don't want to listen to you know, what they're going to do. They all say the same thing. No, we want you to do this. Should be the next, right? We're going to pick you guys, but here is the list of stuff that we want to get done. You know? Not what you mm -hmm. told us you're going to do because that's, your, that's, that's the business as usual. There's no more business as usual. We are entering a different, it's a different era. The youth are running shit right now. So let the young people step up, you know, and really, you know, make it be known. And I think we have a very good opportunity to, to, to pull in some of the uh, Obama-like, um, you know, outcome or uh, outpour for, for voting and a little bit more of the older you know people coming to vote as well i think it's it's it's, it's really needed right now we have to really pull people out to come in vote it's not it's a it's, a, it's to vote someone out not even to vote it's like voting voting republican party out the senate and trp yeah <laughs> all the races matter all the right. you know it's like right now your governor is almost like more of a question of life or death than the president, depending on what state yeah. you're in, how your governor deals with it. And a lot of people are like, ah, the governors don't matter. It's like, yeah, they, <laughs> we really see at this moment how your life choice, you know, the chances of you <laughs> living past nine months depend on whether your governor believes in science, how tied they are into like this idea yeah. of like, oh, money, profit is the most important. Is profit the most important thing or is people the most important thing, you know? Um, and state by state, it's very different. And I think it's been a, a, an awakening, you know, a revelation for a lot of people of like yeah. how much they're like, who are these people? Like either they're, they're the people paid. you voted for, they're the, pe they're the very <laughs> people you voted yes. for, or 
they're the people who won because you didn't show up and vote. You know, those are the people Very that well, are but... getting to decide right now. Yeah. Um, and so that, you know, it's like democracy is not a spectator sport. And um, this is a, is a moment where we, everybody needs to become more educated and more involved you know, um, and, ad, you know, advocating for themselves. And, and always the, it's like one of the things is we've always, like in America, because of this idea of upward mobility, we always tend to side politically with people who have more than us rather than with people who have less than us. Where the, where the likelihood, especially now, is that we will be <laughs> like the people that have less than us rather than the people who have more than, the people who have more want to keep more. So they're not looking out for anybody below them. Yeah. But everybody in the middle class is all like, oh, one day I can become a millionaire. So I'm going to support the people who, you know, open up those roles rather than the people who are like making sure that there's a safety net. And I think every, because there's no ceiling in this country and you can become Jeff Bezos, that means that there's no floor. So we need a floor and that means we need a ceiling of some kind. Yeah. The ceiling could be really high, but the floor can't be low. Yeah. There's too many, we travel all around this country, man. And there's like every city that we've gone to, it's like the tent cities, the number of folks who are homeless that are living on the street, that are dealing with the consequences of the financial crash that yeah. happened 12 years ago, plus gentrification, um, plus lack of good jobs, you know, plus debt um, have driven them to the street. And it's, it, and it's not, it's like, there's this kind of um, in this country, like, oh, you're poor, so you must be bad. And it's like, man, they just ran out of resources. There's an idea that they made bad choices. I make bad choices all the time. I just have <laughs> enough resources to cover up for it. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, you know, whereas someone on the street, they, they just ran out of money. You know, they might have made far fewer bad choices. Maybe they didn't make any bad choices. They just don't have, they don't have choices of, to make. Yeah, yeah <laughs> there's plenty of rich people who make bad choices all the time. They just have a system that keeps them yeah. up and under a roof, you know? Um, it's more a question of just, you know, there no, and, and there's no economic use. So I think on the other side of this uh, pandemic, we have to figure out if we are a society, then we have to figure out a place for everybody and a place that everybody can um, achieve their maximum potential. And that place is not prison. It's not a mental institution. It's not, you know, there needs to be other places, like there, there needs to be a place because right now there's too many um, people that are rendered disposable, you know, yeah. by the system that we have. If you, if, there's, if you can't generate profit for somebody, we don't have a use for you. And if you don't actually have a safety net or inheritance, well, then you're kind of fucked. There's a, there's a piece of highway and hopefully you can find a tent. And that's, that's what you get for not being economically useful. And yes. so that's, that's the attitude in almost every city that we go to. I live in, in San, uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And it's like, it's oh, yeah. so expensive. Mm -hmm. There's thousands of people living outside, like oh, RVs, yeah. tents, you know, just on the pavement. Um, and it's, this wasn't like this when I was, you know, 15. It was starting to grow, but it means that, the, you know, the heart of the country is becoming a lot harder. And I think this is a moment where we can, you know, to what Amaya was saying, like heal. How do we, how do we revive the heart of this country? Because right now it's, it's very sick, you know? There's a chance, hopefully, you know, this, I think whatever happens in this next, uh, the next president, He's gonna get a whole lot of, you know, he's gonna, his death is gonna be full. I mean, I mean, even the way Biden is talking right now, he seems like, you know, he's he's ready to to bring all those people on, people that he knows would would you know would would help stuff stuff. So, but at, at the same time, uh, I, I'm not gonna think about what he was before because every one of them would have to come with a different game, you know, this this next world. So it's like a, it's a, it's a change. It will be a change world. And I hope he mm -hmm. and his, uh, and you know, the team he brings aboard are ready for it because mm -hmm. we need completely, we need something drastic, you know, starting with the healthcare, obviously, you know. Oh yeah. So you know, I'm, I'm excited for for what's what's gonna, it's whatever is coming it will definitely be better, you know. If not, <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Murder Mars. <laughs> that that that. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to ask you one last question. What music are you currently listening to? Let's see. I um, 
a bunch of stuff. I'll uh, I'll pull some records. Right. I'm sitting right by my turntable. Uh, Lee Dorsey, uh, Night People, 1977, nice. uh, New Orleans stuff. Uh, this is, oh, Mayo, I got to share this with you. This is um, uh, Sarah Webster oh. Fabio. Mm. So this was recorded in 1970, and she was a poet at, um, that was born in the 20s. So when she made this in like 70, she was 50. And she recorded it with her son, like three of her kids, like teenage kids are the band. And wow. it's poetry over really hard jazz funk. Um, and then, yeah, I'm starting to get, uh, I'm trying to borrow a mixer, a DJ mixer from a friend so I can kind of do, um, yeah. DJ, you know, DJ mixes, but I'm just, I have one turntable here and I'm just, yeah, listening to yeah. a lot. Here's my, my vinyl collection. So I'm wow. kind of just, going through Look at that. yeah it's shrunk it's grown and shrunk over the years like moving so much you know you have records and you got to give them up mm. you leave them with a friend they lose them or with <laughs> so it's it's grown and expanded but um yeah it's it's again like i said it's a good time to just get into what you have revisit things you know we all buy a book or something that we never buy and it just sits on the shelf and it's like oh I'm gonna get that book right now. You know, <laughs> it's a good moment to just sit with um, what you have and and get into it and, and be grateful. So, I mean, I've been I've, uh, for me, I've been kind of listening to. I haven't really got, gotten into my collection yet. That's my next. You know, since since we get this record player, we've been talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and um, today, I I was spending a lot of time listening to Into the Unknown. Into the unknown, into the unknown, like that. Yeah, <laughs> I've been learning that because of my daughter. You know, she, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, okay, already. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm listening to a lot. I totally feel you. Yeah. You know, a lot of musical stuff that are yeah. you know, from Disney. Mm. Um, and obviously, I've been also trying to get get back into all my all my all my songs. I can do some piano stuff. So hmm. I'm hoping to announce something in a, in about a week or so. I will start doing weekends. Um, I'm already presently. I'm 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 teaching kung fu every day, like 10 a.m. Yeah. every day on Zoom. So, but I, what I'm doing now with once that is already that's kind of up and running. And when I I'm gonna start packaging the uh, the classes. With the music, so mm -hmm. Fist of Flowers. If you were like you were asking earlier, people can now start listening to Fist of Flowers, and I can break down the the, the breakdown section, so mm -hmm. you can see how those movements kind of like can be augmented with the song and stuff like yeah. a soundtrack for for, um, for students. So that's exciting to be at least going into these areas. Uh, so I'm again, I'm looking forward to like really getting into because I have I have a large collection of records. I, yeah. I, I, I have, I have a, it's a little crazy back there, but, but I do have a collection and um, I'm excited to get into that. Yeah. So. This is my record collection. Just this. Wow. I really got to grow mine. Everything's digital? Yeah. Well, Everything's I mean, if you're moving around a lot, it, <laughs> keep it flexible. There's, there's, yeah. There That's will always true. be records out there. You know, if they're a really heavy thing, it's like a commitment. You know, every time you yeah. move, if you're moving a lot, it's like, oh my gosh, wow, the things weigh a ton. You either got to have a very strong back or some very good friends. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you're moving and you have a lot of records, it's, uh, yeah. It's yeah. But back to that thing, I mean, it's like, what I like about them is like, they're an artifact, you know, they're big yeah. enough that you can hold yeah. and um, really enjoy like the, you know, like the, the resolution of it and, yeah. you know, to dig into it. And as a kid, that's how I experienced music, you know, was like, my dad and my mom's records like looking you know people to hold it and yeah, they felt I so imagine, big because i was yeah. a little kid um you know getting to see there's room on the back for like who played on the record like yeah. you have the you know the musicians uh the production information like all that is much more of an enriching thing whereas if you just get an mp3 yeah you can kind of click and dig through the metadata and yeah. stuff but it's not the same thing as here it is all right yeah. there like picture the whole you the, holding the physical package is a lot um, 
it feels more special. See, can I see that record yeah. again? The one that you showed earlier. No, no, no the, the other poetry. one. You know the poetry one, I think. He's talking about the other one that. Uh, uh, it's you. The poetry one. Yeah. yeah, the poetry one. Yeah, I really like that one. I'm gonna try to get that. It's a cool yeah. font. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah, I know that. That's a cool font. I know that font. That's awesome, man. Poems yeah. by what's that? Sarah. Sarah Webster Fabio. Webster. Fabio. Yeah, I'll send you the YouTube cool. link. The whole record is up on uh, on YouTube. All right. Well, thank you again for coming and talking with us. Thank you. The audience who Chronicles came out February seventh. You can stream it now. Put in an order for a record. It won't ship till after the pandemic, but you can get get it, secure it. Martin's showing right now. It's beautiful art done by Amaya himself. You can listen to it now. We're probably gonna play a little bit of it right after this interview. So. Again, thank you for coming on. Have a lovely day. I know it's been a very long interview. I'll let you get back to your lives. Hey, thank thanks you. for taking the time to talk to us. Okay. Yeah, you have a good one, okay? All right, right, will do. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Bless. Will do, of course. Stay safe. <laughs>